Our next speaker is Dr. Phil Williams. He is the Ferran Visiting Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and he is going to be discussing the challenge of contrasting societal demands between flood control and restoration along California's rivers. Please help join me in welcoming Dr. Phil Williams. Well, river and wetland restoration is where most of the restoration dollars are being spent in the United States. And as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm focusing on what I see as the, one of the most significant institutional, uh, conceptual, and psychological uh, constraints on effective river restoration. Um, I thought I'd start my presentation by showing you at least one picture, a nice picture of a river. Let me see if I can. And this is the only nice picture of a river you're going to see in my presentation. Uh, it's, this is a remnant of the extensive floodplain uh, wetlands from the rivers in the Central Valley of California. Uh, that have been largely decimated by human activities over the last 150 years. And uh, uh, this is the imperative of, re of restoring these kind of systems is what's driving uh, uh, so much of the expenditure of river restoration. Although I have focused my professional activities in the last 35 years on developing this practice of river restoration, I was actually trained as a hydraulics engineer to actually dam, divert, and channelize these rivers. Um, and this meant that during my career, many times I've been asked by environmental groups or resource management agencies uh, to help them evaluate or challenge env environmentally destructive flood control or dam projects and to help advance the new policies of flood management, uh, which we refer to as flood hazard reduction policies, which are now established nationally and statewide. In the early 1990s, I was asked to look at what was happening to the creeks in Santa Barbara County. As part of a consultant team, I was asked to suggest new ways of managing flood risks while res restoring the riparian environment. Only 20 years ago, it was the normal practice for the Santa Barbara County Flood Control District to bulldoze many of the creek beds and uh, remove vegetation before each winter flood season, as you can see here. Oops. Uh, I believe this is a Pascadero Creek. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe some of you here in the audience were involved in this uh, controversy back in the 20 odd years ago. You're probably familiar. I, I'm actually not sure what happened <laughs> as a result of our activities. But these kind of activities, these uh, flood control maintenance activities, were actually fairly typical of the time. And you know, here's a more extreme example from my native country, England, uh, where you can see maintenance of the high, uh, how difficult and costly maintenance is to maintain the flood control characteristics of uh, a flood control channel. But there is a kind of logic to these activities that is clearly antithetical to river restoration. The central idea of flood control is to maximize the value of a developable land by minimizing the width of the river channel and by eliminating its floodplain. This can only be done by grading the channel to artificially speed up the flow, by eliminating vegetation, straightening the channel, or by building up levees. Sometimes we refer to this uh, approach, flood control approach, as straight jacketing the river. Unfortunately, in the 50 years or so since these flood control projects were built, we have found that rivers don't behave in the many times the way that river engineers wanted them to. Here we see the Walla Walla River, which is channelized by the Corps of Engineers reasserting itself into its natural form after the 1964 flood. In these flood control channels, sediment builds up, banks erode, riparian trees want to grow. 
but this, but in order to maintain these flood control functions, we have to do, we have to eliminate those processes. And this pre prevent in this this kind of maintenance, this kind of management, river management, pre uh, ver prevents recovery of virtually every ecological valuable attribute of the river. It was through experiences like mine of of trying to persuade a local flood control district to change ecologically destructive practices that I became aware of this larger conceptual problem that impedes effective river restoration. The central problem is the unreconciled conflict between our false idea that we can control rivers to eliminate all flood risks and our desire to reintroduce nature and wildness in our river corridors. Now this is really important because in 2005, the Millennium Ecosystems Report was published. This was a product of 1,300 scientists from all around the world working for the United Nations, different academic institutions, different national governments and NGOs, looking at status and trends in global ecosystems. And it makes for pretty grim reading. So let's take a look at how it ranked the different global ecosystems. Here we see red denotes in critically impacted and an upward arrow uh, denotes that the, the trend is for further dis, uh, de accelerating destruction. What comes, to, uh, right, comes out right away is tropical rainforests are in pretty bad shape and getting a lot worse. But take a look down below here, inland water e uh, ecosystems, river and wetland ecosystems, also severely impacted, also uh, the trend is for a much more rapid further degradation. So these anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, imp global impacts are pretty recent and the, uh, the Millennium Ecosystems Report describes how most of these impacts have actually occurred throughout the world in about the last 50 years. And these are impacts are a consequence of our the human powers that have been unleashed by the Industrial Revolution that enable us to transform river systems. Um, <clears throat> we have to look back in time and get a sense of how large a scale these transformations are and how they impact river e ecosystems. And the, the first place where it happened was on the River Rhine. This was the first large river system to be completely transformed uh, in, the, in the last 200 years. This is what it looked like uh, it, where, uh, in the 1810 before uh, the engineer Tula, who was the leader, leading river engineer in Germany, got his hands on it. Uh, as you can see, the interesting thing about this is not only you had an intact river ecosystem, but you also had a, a quite a dense human population that was living uh, with the river, in the river corridor, taking advantage and using those resources. This is what it looked like after the uh, engineering projects were completed. Complete isolation of those uh, floodplain and communities and the human communities that uh, relied on those systems. But here in California, of course, we've, we were, we're also a little ahead of a curve from the rest of the world. Uh, we've transformed our rivers mainly in the period from about the 1920s to the 1970s. We've channelized them, we've dammed them, and we've levied them. And the result is, you can see, when you look at the, what's happened to our uh, floodplain or river ecosystems, um, as a result of all these human activities, there's a huge transformation. In fact, on the left, you can see what it, a reconstruction of what the, uh, the landscape would have been looked like in a, uh, 150 years ago, or so ago, and how with just a few remnants of uh, wetlands on the, on the right. So we're now living in this post-water development era and are kind of woken up to a, a kind of a, a hangover and trying to fix our headache with river restoration. And in doing so, the, we've started to learn a lot more about how river ecosystems work. Although, uh, oops, I think I... 
although uh, uh, although river dependent ecosystems are just as complex as ter as upland uh, ecosystems, the movement of the the they are strongly dependent on the the physical processes that affect the the the, um, the, the, the ecology. And it's the movement of water and sediment um, that is so important. Restoring the integrity of those physical processes is really important in uh, river restoration. So, and I want to give you just an example of a simple conceptual model of how uh, how a, a, a lowland river ecosystem should be functioning and how we've altered it. Here's uh, just a cross section of a, a lowland river where you can see that it has a a floodplain that's periodically inundated, a water table that sustains backwater wetlands. This is how everything is supposed to work. And when you examine it in more detail and look at the interaction between the ecology and the hydrology, you can see how at different times seasonally, the, uh, how vegetation is responding to uh, flood pulses, how fish use the floodplain. Um, there's a whole host of complex interactions from the ecosystem, all that relies on the interconnection between the river channel, the river channel overflowing its banks, inundating the floodplain. And uh, you can clearly see that the whole the system works uh, as a unit. When we build flood control levers, this is what we do. We completely isolate the floodplain eliminate all those functions. Also have uh, significant adverse effects on what goes on in the, in the river channel itself. But uh, we can also uh, eliminate the floodplain by other means, by altering the hydrology of the watershed or by building dams, um, by straightening rivers. And this can create a geomorphic process called incision of a, ri of a river channel, which cut which erodes the bed of a river channel, lowers the bed, and it dries out the floodplain, with it, even without um, building levees. So the concept of restoring physical process is to try to reconnect these processes, to reactivate those floodplains, get them wet again. And you can see some examples of where this has been done. Here the Nature Conservancy reached the levee on the lower Kasumnas River. This is what it looked like the first year. You can see this used to be an agricultural field. And uh, the first year of flood deposited this nice sandbar in the, on the agricultural field. By the next year, uh, you're already starting to see cottonwood starting to occupy that sandbar. And you know, I, I scratched around trying to find what it looks like now. Whoops, I wasn't able to locate a good picture, but it's now fully vegetated, fully wooded, uh, that area. And the UC Davis has actually been doing research on the fish use in that area, and this is what they're finding. Uh, that this is a native fish, is a split tail. They're finding that fish that are reared on the floodplain, that flooded floodplain, of the same age class, are much larger and healthier, much more robust than the ones that actually are confined to the channel. And this confirms those, all those interactions between restoring the physical process of flooding, reflooding the floodplain, uh, and how we need to go about restore, uh, restoration. And another example, on the, uh, more specifically, on where a channel has been incised and how that can be, can, we can reactivate floodplains is here on Redwood Creek, just down by uh, below Muir Woods, where a, 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 a um, floodplain terrace was graded, and after in a in a large flood now, instead of the fields being dry, now they're getting flooded, and uh, willows, alders uh, are establishing themselves in that area. So this is the kind of this is what I mean by restoring physical processes, and um, the. Uh, so over the last 40 years or so, we've seen how public opinion has shifted to supporting and protecting the environment. And we've developed new ways of thinking about how we should live along the river. And we see ourselves as wardens or long-term managers of river systems. 
that balances human uses requiring reduction of flood hazards and the needs of the environment. It is this, within this context of multi-objective river management that river, river restoration actions are, re, are tools for rebalancing trade-offs that were made uh, many years ago. But the major challenge facing river restoration is that we're usually trying to retrofit an obsolete river engineering infrastructure that was designed at a time when the long-term environmental and economic impacts of levees or channels or dams were, uh, were unknown, were ignored, or were disdained. So inevitably, there's a conflict between the old flood control paradigm and the new river management or restoration paradigm. And you can see this kind of, I like this, really uh, captures that conflict where this is done put out by uh, um, an organization called River Revival. And you can see that we have to change an old paradigm in order to achieve a new one. That's kind of a nice capture of that concept. Um, but more important than this, the physical bequest of the flood control channel systems, the dams that we've been left with, is the institutional, conceptual, and psychological legacy of the idea of flood control that acts as a major constraint on effective restoration. Too often we see unrealistic flood control design criteria imposed on river restoration projects that negate their environmental benefits. And there's an example from England. This is a restoration project on the Skirn River in the United Kingdom where the flood control agency insists that any uh, tree, repairing trees that grow up here is stripped from the riverbanks. Over the past 40 years, federal and state government have adopted flood hazard reduction policies that encompass a range of tools, including zoning, flood proofing, relocation, insurance, flood warning systems, levy setbacks. These are all compatible with the fundamental needs for river restoration, which is to give back room for the river. Unfortunately, although we have adopted the right policies for flood uh, hazard reduction, we have delegated its execution to agencies that were set up to enact flood control measures possibly a uh, hundred years ago, such as the Corps of Engineers or local flood control districts, but without giving them, necessarily giving them the tools, the budgets, or the expertise uh, to carry out what we want now. And these flood control agencies are faced with escalating replacement costs as the shortcomings of these simplistic flood control works become apparent, but are now forced to commit to maintaining existing flood control infrastructure, even though there may be significant flood hazard reduction benefits from more imaginative approaches that include restoring rivers. And a couple of examples of this uh, disturbing trend is that here, uh, in 1986, a levee broke on the Uber River in the, in the Central Valley flood dam, inundating the town of Olivehurst uh, and Linda. And uh, the reason why this levee broke was that uh, was the river had been too confined uh, and there was not enough, I'd say there was not enough room for the river. And the, it was, uh, there were uh, piping in the levee and the levee broke. And, this is an illustration of what happens when you over rely on a flood control measure instead of thinking through what could happen in, uh, to, to alleviate flood damages. But uh, unfortunately, there was a, big, a lawsuit that was in, in resolve, resolved in 2003 that ended up hol holding the state of California and by implication all the local flood control agencies to liability for any failure of the flood control infrastructure. And this, this is called the Paterno decision. And what this means is it's impelled these agencies to reinforce levees and flood control infrastructure in place rather than look for more cost-effective ways of reducing flood risks, such as land use controls, restoring functional floodplains, 
and you can see this now all across the state where uh, agencies are scrambling for funds to try to just patch up with what they have now. And second, in the aftermath of the levee failures in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, the, the Corps of Engineers uh, decided that it was time to evaluate the integrity of its le uh, levees nationwide and has come to a determination that vegetation on levees is, is simply not, a, uh, we cannot, they cannot allow trees to grow on levees um, like this here. And those flood control uh, systems that we have in place on the major rivers in California, the last remnants of, <laughs> of the uh, riparian ecology is provided by what's been growing on these levees. Now the Corps of Engineers is, is insisting that these tree, all these trees be removed. The state of California is fighting this decision and it actually has not been resolved. But elsewhere in the country, this is what's happening is uh, in order to maintain those levees in place based on these decisions that were made, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, which ignored the environmental effects, uh, the vegetation is having to be stripped of these levees. So, and, and uh, of course, what we find is that's when you look into this, that the, the trees, in most instances, have very little to do with, with levee integrity. And, uh, that's another frustrating aspect of this. One reason why the zombie idea of flood control won't die is that people have got used to thinking of rivers in the wrong way, as places limited only to the area between the channel banks or between the levees not the active floodplain or the river corridor that provides much of the environmental and flood hazard reduction benefits. Instinctively, still, after each major flood, there is a public demand for more and better flood control to keep the river in place rather than more or better flood management that would allow for restoration of the ecosystem along the river corridor. In part, we were motivated by perverse incentives, uh, like the wrong kind of subsidies for flood insurance that encourage people to develop floodplains. But in part, it's because we simply don't understand the landscape we live in. We're still strangers on the land, like these early pioneers on the floodplains of California. This is a photograph from the 18, 1862 flood that inundated the Central Valley. Well, is there a way of overcoming these obstacles? Well, I hope I got across maybe three key points. One is, for effective river restoration, we need room for the river, which means releasing from, from the straitjackets flood control has imposed on it. It means we need a lot, lot wider right-of-way widths to work with. It also means re-educating people about what a river is, but it does encompass an active floodplain and how valuable the, the ecology of the floodplain is. And to achieve the cumulative benefits of flood hazard reduction and river restoration, we need competent river management authorities who can actually uh, carry out the changes that need to take place and manage these river systems into the future. So has this been done anywhere? Not really, but there are some hopeful signs. Um, and this is the Napa River uh, 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 Flood Protection Project. Um, and it's through the, this was originally a Corps of Engineers flood control channelization project through the downtown of the city of Napa. And um, fortunately, the uh, design and uh, planning and design of this was was taken away from the Corps of Engineers at an early stage and t and led by the community, the city, the county, local environmental groups. And we were able to get new a new approach that was uh, to redesigning, cum providing cumulative benefits of restoration and flood hazard reduction through the city uh, by giving room for the river by grading terraces, as you can see through the downtown area, and uh, by building flood walls. So we did have some structural elements in here in this, in this project. 
But, uh, and this is what it looked like after the, uh, the grading. So you can actually see that the river channel has been widened. We've now got opportunities for, for, uh, for wetlands and floodplains along the river channel. I think one of the most important things about this project, actually, though, was the insistence of the local community that the words flood control not be used to describe the project. It was called a flood protection project. And I think that was a more appropriate. That conceptual or psychological advance was very significant. Well, I want to conclude by going back to my title. I call this a classic restoration conflict the conflict between flood control and river restoration. And I think it's typical of many of the places where we've now adopted new ideas and attitude uh, and uh, values about restoring uh, environment, but we've outstripped our institutional, conceptual, and psychological framework for actually uh, for implementing those, pro those uh, projects. So that's the challenge facing us. Thank you.